If you're not getting that email, you can email me and I'll add you to the list. I send out an email where we're going, the general points of the message, things of that nature. Uh, we're going to go to a very exciting place today. We're talking about wives and we're talking about husbands. <gasps> Whoa! I tell you, you come to a fun passage like this, you read it, and 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 you go, what? That is if you're coming to the passage with a skeptical mind and heart. We'll just put the spiritual label on that. Uh, let us begin with a word of prayer, because we're going to need a lot of supernatural help to understand what is being said here. Father, thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be mindful of what you've designed humanity for and what you've asked us to do. Lord, help us to grab hold of that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to come to these seven verses in the Bible. And it is not a marriage uh, lecture. I mean, that's not the reason why Peter has given it. However, we can learn an awful lot from these short few verses. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. We have been going verse by verse through the book of Peter. And uh, we're looking at the things that uh, the Lord would say to us. So verse by verse, we're going to 1 Peter chapter 3, Verse 1. This ought to be fun. Here we go. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. So, I knew there was an amen in it. Did you get that recorded on the mic here? It was that guy. Yeah, wait till we get finished, buddy. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. What? Did you catch all that stuff? Yeah. Check it out. Weaker partner, be submissive. Okay, how about this, wives? Your husband comes home from work, and you're like, would the master like a biscuit with his dinner? Would the master like to watch television? Would the master like me to draw him a bath while I bring him his slippers? What in the world is going on? This is crazy, isn't it? It seems at first, except we need to remember, we're 2,000 years remo removed from this culture. We're also considerably removed from God's design in many things. And I'm not suggesting that any of what I just said is God's design. We're going to unpack what God's design is. So let's start with this one. First of all, there are some magic words that appeared. And no, I'm not talking about obey, submissive, or weak. There are some magic words that appear in this passage that you really need to understand or none of it makes sense. Did you catch it? In the same way. That's very important to understand what those words mean. In the same way what? It's sort of like that therefore. There's this nice little phrase, this placeholder is telling, remember everything we talked about last week? It applies this week. Everything we said last week, and what did we say last week? Okay, well, let's look at it. We said this, all Christians are to submit themselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Why? For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Okay, so last week we talked about the fact that as believers, we're supposed to be in submission to all authorities, all institutions of men, whether it be the courthouse, whether it be law enforcement, whether it be the government, whether it be the federal government, state government, whatever. We're supposed to be in submission because it honors God, not because they're better or smarter or any of these other issues. It's rather be in submission because it honors God. And God has a purpose in every single institution. He's working it out. So we talked about that last week. So we don't forget that when we suddenly come to this week. The amazing thing is that Peter would even mention women at all. 
The truth was, in the day and age that Peter lived in, and throughout most of human history, quite frankly, up until the last couple hundred years, and until the, the United States of America, quite frankly, and the movement that happened within our country, women have not been treated well. Let me say that again. Women have not been treated well. They've been treated as property. They've been dominated by their male counterparts. It has not been a pleasant time it, 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 for women throughout history. So you come to this passage of Scripture, and he is talking to them directly? It's remarkable. And so let's be to unpack this. There's three things immediately we talk about when we say submission. If all Christians are to be in submission, he now wants to point out to wives. Submission for the authority of God's placement. Submit yourself to the Lord and submit yourself to the authorities instituted amongst men. Why? For the Lord's sake. In other words, God's doing something with it. Number two, for the sake of our witness. And number three, to silence ignorant talk of foolish men. Okay, we've got to get deep into this. We need to understand this right. First of all, let's start with the most obvious one. The word submission. Immediately, it falls into the category sort of like meekness. Remember we talked about meekness? We thought it was weak and mild and wimpy and weakness means, or meekness means weakness. So we come to the word submission and we think of the exact same thing. But that's not what we're talking about. In fact, submission, the Greek word is a military term, meaning to appoint or arrange under authority or leadership. Now let's back up. That means God's appointed, ordained, or determined roles, authority, or responsibility. The governor has the responsibility to govern. And law enforcement has responsibility to uphold laws. Each institution has its own purpose and reason behind it. So as we come to this, suddenly we realize that submission is to silence the charges and the accusation of foolish people. If you remember from last week, we briefly talked about this. Society has accused Christianity of being subversive. Christianity was and is today perceived as a threat. One of the reasons most communist nations are not only against Christianity, but trying to stomp it out, it's a perceived threat to their authority. They recognize their abuses within, and they don't like the idea that the people may rise up from within. So what does this have to do with marriage? Well, here's what's fascinating. You see, when a woman comes to know Jesus Christ, she receives all the freedoms of every other believer when she comes to know Jesus Christ. And in that day and age, and even today in some parts of the world, what would happen is new freedoms were suddenly found for this person. Suddenly they had new freedoms, and if their husband had not become a believer, there is an immediate problem right? It's one of the reasons why the Bible says you should be evenly yoked, and by that meaning a believer should not be marrying an unbeliever. But today, as well as throughout history, we find a lot of women who have come to know the Lord and are married to someone who is not a believer. And so suddenly they had newfound freedoms. They found themselves in positions where they even were speaking publicly and recognized as a person. And Christianity brought a lot of value, which we'll look at later, to a, who a woman actually is. This was perceived, can you imagine it, was perceived as a threat. I mean, the next thing we know, they're going to be driving, they're going to have, you know, they're going to be able to vote, they're going to be able to decide all kinds of things for themselves. This can't happen. So Christianity was perceived as a threat. And indeed, even uh, Paul, as he writes, we'll get to his letters eventually someday, he writes to other young pastors trying to help him deal with the threat, the, the quote-unquote subversiveness of society seeing these women and saying, oh, look at them, they're not in submission to their, their husbands, they're just, they're out of control, these crazy women. And so we get to this issue where, wait a minute, God's word reminds us that we're supposed to be in submission to human authority, earthly rulers, governments, and now Peter brings up marriage. There must have been a real problem there, huh? Must have been some serious issues going on. Well, let's immediately take the air out of the tires and make sure we know what we're talking about. Let's start with a quote. To submit is not the same as to be inferior. To submit is not the same as to be inferior. You need to know that from the get-go. You're not to be in submission to your husband because he's smart or bright or cute or anything else. You're in submission for the Lord's sake, remember? You're in submission for the sake of your witness. In fact, we immediately begin to realize, you know, the thrust of this passage is four wives living with an unbelieving husband, mostly. This is someone who doesn't know the Lord. And so really being coming to a place where we want to make sure that we have the best witness possible to an unbelieving spouse. And so to submit is not the same as to be inferior. How do we know that? Not being rhetorical. 
How do we know that submission is not the same as being inferior? Because that's what our world thinks. Immediately you hear submit to your husband, you see, you think that, oh, well, the woman's inferior, therefore she has to submit to a man so that she can be alive. What kind of nonsense is this? Why do we know that submission is not the same as inferiority? Jesus is our example. Remember those words, in the same way? It doesn't just go to that whole passage. It goes to in the same way as Christ Jesus was our example. He came and he was in submission. He became a man. He was in submission to our Heavenly Father. He was in submission to the Sanhedrin court as they pronounced judgment. He became in submission. Just as when we say he's the ultimate example of meekness, he is certainly not weak. So we begin to learn something about submission. It is not inferiority. And here's a news flash in case you, you didn't catch this one. <laughs> Women are not inferior to men. The Bible nowhere teaches that one. Here's something even more fascinating that people are confused on. The Bible does not teach that women need to be subject to men. It does not teach that. Not universally, let me explain. Some people wrongly think that there shouldn't be a woman judge. The Bible doesn't specify that at all. Where do you get that from? Or, or, or imagine a woman police officer. What? Or imagine you go through the whole list of different places of authority, and nowhere does the Bible say they cannot take those positions of authority. There are two areas, one of them highly controversial, we get to when we get to Paul's letters. One of them is what roles are allowed within the church. We as a Wesleyan church affirm the ministry of women, and we'll get to that when we get there. But the other one is in marriage. Men are not supposed to be in submission to their spouses. Men are not supposed to be in submission because it's God's design that way. Not because the man is, is greater than the woman, but because of the responsibilities and roles that God has placed on them. So when we get to this, you begin to realize that, that in the Bible, Deborah, does anyone remember who Deborah was? The judge ruler, the one in authority over all of Israel. Boy, women are just inferior, huh? God did that. As we come to the Bible, we see there were women, quote-unquote, apostles, Junius, and we see there were women teachers, and we see there was all kinds of things. And again, when we get to Paul's letters, we'll get there. So this idea that women are supposed to be subject to men is not a biblical standard. So today, we're talking about marriage and how it's supposed to function. But for us to really grab hold of it, we need to understand that the Bible is universally criticized in this area. Because everything I just said, they believe the Bible teaches that women must be subject to men. Wrong. Sorry. Reread your Bible. That's not what it says. It talks about issues of authority within the church and how God expects it to function. It talks about authority within the marriage, how God expects it to function. But it is not what is often criticized. Let me, let me illustrate this way. This is funny. Have you ever heard uh, a women's movement criticizing philosophy? It's pretty rare. They want to criticize faith and religion in the Bible without actually understanding what it teaches. But let's go with Aristotle. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Aristotle. Anyone? Yeah, he's pretty famous. He's a famous philosopher. And it wasn't just his position, but it was fairly universal in the positions of philosophers. Do you know what they believed and what they taught their students and what even to this day tends to reign? Much celebrated philosopher Aristotle taught and argued that, and I quote, women were by nature inferior to men in every way, here comes the compliment, except sexually. Oh, how magnanimous of you, Aristotle, to include the sexual thing. I wonder why he included that. So in philosophy, indeed in the culture, women were property. In the time and day of the Bible, you see, they could not even vote. Not vote, excuse me. They could not even testify in court. They couldn't testify in court because they were considered not trustworthy. Whoa, this is wild. And so they take the thoughts of the day and the age where women were treated like property and they were dominated throughout society and they say, see, the Bible perpetuates such nonsense. Oh, really? What Bible are you reading exactly? Because I read that women were the first one to see Jesus after he rose from the dead. That's a place of honor. I see that women were actually included by Jesus as disciples. That's quite an honor. I see, in fact, that Jesus' ministry was funded by very wealthy women. Isn't that interesting? We see in Genesis chapter 1, we talk about go to the book, go to the instruction book. From the very beginning of the book, we're told something about women that seems to be just completely forgotten. Remember Genesis 1, 26 and 27? It said that man is supposed to rule and dominate the earth. And by man, we mean man, right? It goes on to say that God made mankind in his image. Male and female in the image of God. Both were made in the image of God. Both had those amazing things and value and worth. And God's instructions on marriage doesn't change that. 
So when we come to this, we need to understand that though the Bible is criticized, it is not teaching that women are inferior to men. Instead, it's saying God has a purpose for marriage, and it functions best when we live out that purpose, okay? And by submission, it doesn't mean your husband is greater than you, smarter than you, or anything else. In fact, it could be quite the opposite. Anyone married to a dope? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) My wife will be in the second service, and we can hear from her. So really, it's talking about, okay, so how do you win your husband to the Lord? How do you do this? How do you win somebody who's not a believer? And it even talks about without using words. Well, clearly by dominating him is not going to work. Usurping his role, his position within the marriage family is not going to work. So what does work? Let me go back to this verse again. Wives, in the same way as Christ being our example, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. It isn't ironic that when you go back to this passage of Scripture, you know what most people pull out of that? Not just the the wrong minded ideas of submission they also pull out some rules did you know in the early church they had literally forbidden braided hair they, they, they forbidden jewelry of any gold or, or adornment and they forbid Christians to wear fancy or nice clothes is it ironic that they would pull out three outward rules on a passage that's talking about your inward beauty, right? Even John Wesley, which obviously I have a high degree of respect for, if you go to his notes on the Bible in this particular passage, that's what he deals on. He says, well, clearly three things are forbidden here. Christians should not wear gold jewelry. Christians should not braid their hair. Actually, he called it curl their hair. Interesting. And then Christians should not wear fine clothes. Listen, even the early church, the Nazarene church, they weren't wearing gold. They trade in their wedding bands and necklaces and they wore silver instead, as if that suddenly abides by the passage of the text. Listen, this is not forbidding braided hair. It's not forbidding gold jewelry. What is it forbidding? It's saying that your beauty should not come from trying to pretend and gloss up the outside. It should flow from the inside out. In other words, a woman's soul who has been touched by God in genuine submission to God's plan of redemption is going to be very winsome to her husband. And so as we begin to unpack this, we realize that a godly woman whose inward beauty radiates outward. This is a truth for all believers. And the other reason we know that it's not forbidding gold jewelry and these kinds of things, or braided hair, or fine clothes, if you go to Proverbs 31, I don't know, ladies, you ever been there? Talks about this amazing godly woman. What does it tell us about her? Tells us an awful lot of amazing things. One thing it tells us that she makes nice clothes for her family in purple which is the color of royalty, the color of great richness. It says that she has fine linen herself. In fact, one translation says silk clothing that is purple in nature. In other words, she is wonderfully adorned. But it's not without the character that surpasses that. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, we spend an awful lot of time outwardly trying to make ourselves look better. We spend a lot of time outwardly trying to make ourselves more presentable. But how much time do we spend inwardly dealing with the issues of the heart, mind, and soul? Augustine, who is a famous early church father, he wrote of his mother some amazing compliments in a work called Confessions. In that work, he talked about how his dad was definitely not a believer. In fact, even Augustine wasn't until much later in life. He talks about how his mother had reached out and just served him and loved him and showed him the grace of God and prayed for him and really was an amazing uh, pillar of the family. Well, late in life, as Augustine's father was facing the end of his life, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And a celebration that's hard to even imagine of all the years of hard work, all the years of love, and all the years of demonstration that Augustine's mother put into that marriage. It was hard. It was difficult. It was brutal, to say the least. And so you come to the place where even God can use you to reach your unsaved husband. God can use you. I am a prime example of a wife who prayed for me while I lived in Las Vegas as a military law enforcement guy, as a drunkard, and a thousand other things. And my wife would do the sneaky, dirtiest little trick. She'd pray over my head while I was sleeping at night. Isn't it interesting that I should come to know the Lord later? It's almost as if prayer is really impactful. 
And so as we get to this, we realize that God can use you to reach your unsaved husband. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we get some just amazing news. Verse 7 jumps up. Verse 7 just blows out any ideas of unbiblical concepts of submission or this idea that weakness means women are inferior or any of that nonsense just gets blown out of the water. It's like Peter was suddenly saying, you could reach your husband. You can save him without even nagging or using words. You can literally bring him to the Lord by your awesome, pure behavior that you just allow God to shape your soul and it will have an impact on the family. You just trust him. You entrust yourself to God even in the face of a dominant, unbelieving husband. You can do this. If he's willing to live with you, live with him, right? Because many Christians, women, were coming to know the Lord. They're like, he ain't going to come to know Jesus. I'm out of here because I need a Christian husband. <laughs> right? And so they were just blowing out of the wedding, blowing out of the marriage as if that's okay. And God's like, hoo, hoo, hoo. Paul even later writes, listen, if they're willing to live with you, live with them. You can reach them for the Lord. And so suddenly we come to this realization, verse 7 hits, it's like Peter suddenly wants to make sure the husbands aren't completely left out, that is the believing husbands, and make sure they don't miss something really important. Hope you didn't miss it. Verse 7, let's look at that again. Verse 7, check this out. Husbands, in the same way, oh, there goes those words again, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. This is something women never had. Treat them with respect. Why? That's my wife. That's my property. She did, she's got no rights. Why should I treat her with respect? He goes on as the weaker partner. Now we see the word weaker and we miss the word partner. Weaker just completely undoes the word partner. The Bible's now delivered a phrase that was universally not accepted in society. Maybe this was the fear of subversion that, that they were at Christianity, suddenly God's word reveals to us that the marriage is a partnership. It goes on. Weaker partner. And as heirs, that is, they have inheritance rights just the same as men do, with you of the gracious gift of life. Not only life here on earth, but the life that is to come. They receive that too. So that nothing will hinder your prayers Oh, 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 all of a sudden, the Word of God is telling us that if you're not talking politely and respectfully and treating your wife in a considerate way, don't even think about approaching God. You will not find favor. In fact, you'll find the opposite. <sighs> Wait a minute, we can come boldly into the throne of God to find grace, right? Not if you're actively living in contradiction of His Word. His Word tells us that we're supposed to be considerate, that is to, to give all consideration. Listen, weaker? Let's get to that for a second. Theologians have a fun debate on this, but it's not a debate as whether women are weaker than men. It's talking about, are we talking about physically, which Peter probably had in mind, or are we talking socially, which Peter may have had in mind? Either way, that's all we're talking about. Either physically, now I serve in the United States Armed Forces, and to the best of my knowledge, I saw one woman that I ever met that was stronger than me, and she was scary, dude. <laughs> tough, man, Tough. Now, by the way, stronger doesn't mean tougher than, right? You know? In any event, for the most part, even the frail, chubby, pear-shaped Sean has greater strength than a lot of the females. So Peter Kurt certainly could have had in mind weaker physical structure, which means we need to protect, right? But I think, moreover, it means socially. The social standing of women up until fairly recent history was really, really bad. And it's like God is saying, yes, they are not socially acceptable. They don't have the same social standing as you, so you be considerate. You be respectful. You don't treat them with less respect because of their social standing. God is saying you treat them with more respect because of their physical or social standing. So you suddenly realize that God is suddenly being very powerful in his presentation and as if to put an exclamation point on the statement, if you're not treating your wife with respect, you're not being considerate and loving your spouse, don't even think that you're going to come to God and find favor. You know, we've talked about it before. It's like talk to the hand. That's what God is saying. You don't talk to your wife in respect and loving, just don't even come to me. You're disobeying me. You're dishonoring that which I created marriage to be. So when we talk about partners in marriage, I want you to get this because some people get really confused. This was a radical idea. So radical, God instituted it in the beginning of time. 
It's like human beings completely forgot Genesis 1, 26 and 27. They completely forgot that women were made in the image of God. They forgot the prophet Joel who said women were going to receive the same Holy Spirit that men received. They forgot the prophet Joel and Ezekiel and so many others that said God, or God is going to institute ministry amongst women and they're going to prophecy and they're going to do amazing things. It's like the church just bumped its head and forgot that women are important too. And then when you come to marriage, they're like, whoa, submission means the man is the CEO and the boss. And suddenly the church has created a bunch of little tyrants, a little Napoleons in marriage. You better submit to me, woman. We're having chimichangas tonight because I'm the man. Is that what the Word of God is actually talking about? No, not at all. So we come to the passages where God's Word reveals to us this amazing unity and partnership that God has created in marriage. But I want you to catch this. It is an equality that's revealed by God, but it is not an equality of responsibility. You catch that? It's not an equality of responsibility. Your husband is going to be held account for his role in marriage. Believer or not... You catch that? Your husband is going to be held accountable for his role and his responsibility. That's it. He's going to be held accountable. So it's not an equal partnership of responsibilities, but it is an equal partnership in all other things. And it's not to be domineering. You know, that word master is very funny. The actual word is Lord. Oh gosh, that's worse, isn't it? Now you're going to call your husband Lord. Hello, Lord of the house. Come on in. I've got the temperature right where you like it. Have a seat. You know, the word Lord, by the way, even Paul used it when when Jesus confronted him on the Damascus Road. He's like, who is it, Lord? He should have known he was blinded and dropped on his tail that it was probably God. But he's like, who is it, Lord? What he meant by Lord is sir, mister. It was a sign of respect, okay? And then when you come and it says, look to the life of Sarah. Time doesn't permit us to get into such great detail. But if you're a little Napoleon in your marriage... Do you know the kind of give and take that was happening in that marriage? The partnership that even in that day and age? You talk about women not being treated well, but actually it was Sarah that got a few things that she wanted, wasn't it? And by clear influence. But it was not by usurping her husband's role. You you get what I'm saying? So when we get to this passage, we realize there is an equality. And in case there's anyone here that's not convinced, let me go to, in our last few minutes, just a couple verses. First one I want to take you to, we will get to Paul's letters eventually. I just want to bring this phrase up. This is found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. You with me? You are all sons of God. Well, that's it. Women are not included. Isn't that what it says? Sons of God. Sorry, ladies. You're done. You're out of it. But wait, there's more. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This isn't the only place the scripture talks about it. From Genesis to the New Testament, there is an equality of men and women in Christ. Absolute, guaranteed equality of value, of worth, of meaning, of purpose. Don't usurp that or you will be held accountable. There is an equality that happens. And so when he says you are sons of God, what he's really saying is you are children with inheritance rights. Because in that culture, only sons were allowed primary inheritance. And God comes out and says, whoa, 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 whoa. There's neither male nor female. I've created you both in the image of God. You all have inheritance rights. Isn't that what Peter said? You are co-heirs to what God has given you with life. So you share in this partnership of life. You share in the partnership of the future. You share in a whole lot of things. So domineering one spouse to the other isn't going to work either way, is it? And being in submission to your husband doesn't mean he makes every decision on the planet for you. Not at all. In fact, you're completely missing the concept of submission. Let me bring it home with one final verse. For any husbands that may be confused... And and in some encouragement to the ladies if they didn't quite get everything we're talking about today. This again comes to Paul. We'll get there eventually. Ephesians 5.25, you know it well. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Did you catch that? So wait a minute. If we're supposed to be in submission to Christ Jesus and now suddenly in marriage we're supposed to have this submission But husbands are supposed to love their spouses as Christ loved the church? How did Christ love the church? 
He domineered the church, right? He took the whip and he whipped that church into shape and he laid down the law and he was harsh and cold and brutal. And no, that's how he treated hypocrites and unbelievers. How did he treat the church? Loved, gave himself for, allowed himself to be beat, mocked, spit on, died for. So suddenly we realize that husbands, believing husbands, are supposed to be giving of themselves to their spouses, sacrificially giving of themselves, loving their wives. You can't dominate your wife and love her at the same time. You can't be a little tyrant in your own home and marriage while at the same time being like Jesus because that's not the way Jesus is. So we begin to see this portrait of what God designed. Have you ever wondered why it is that God said to honor our father and our mother? Maybe you didn't have a father and a mother that was worth honoring, if you know what I mean. Maybe you're like, I ain't honoring them. That's insane. Yeah, them. Because it's the institution that God has established amongst humanity to bring about his will. It's his plan for humanity. He's going to use the family union to reach the rest of the world. He's going to use the stability that the family brings, the honor that marriage brings when it's done God's way, and he's going to use it in power to raise up godly offspring, first and foremost, and then number two, to reach those who don't know him. The whole thrust of this submission, whether it be to authority or government, a city, state, the whole thrust is so that we can have a good witness. That's the whole thrust. Whether a good witness in marriage to an unbelieving spouse or a good witness to our town, the city of Live Oak or the city of Yuba City or to our state, the state of California or whatever. Do you think we're in submission to the governor because he's smarter and brighter than us? Easy. Easy. Honor those in authority, right? No, what we come to, we begin to realize that God has plans and purposes for marriage. And as we get to the letters of Paul, we'll get into it with a little more depth. So hopefully you've been able to hear today God's awesome plan for humanity. Hopefully you've been able to hear the criticisms lobbied at the Bible, that it's woman domineering, that it's male chauvinistic. Hopefully you realize everything the scripture says is actually in contradiction to that thought. But that does not give you license to use your freedom to do something that counteracts your witness. You get what I'm saying? I'm just curious. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder if there's anyone here that has a, a husband who's not here today and doesn't know Jesus Christ. You know the odds are? Yeah. You know why? Because every church is filled with very perceiving, discerning women who love God. Quite frankly, I would say that women are superior to men in many, many ways. Men, you don't believe that? Uh, try going into labor. <laughs> If it was up to men, humanity would be doomed, right? Because I ain't doing that. Or a thousand other ways. One way in which women are often very superior is their discernment of the things of the Spirit. Very sensitive to God. And so they come to know Jesus, and they come and honor, worship God, knowing that they're going to go home to a spouse that rejects everything they believe in. Wow, it just drives them closer into the arms of the Lord. And the Lord says, don't give up. I'm sure Augustine's mother spent many, many years running her household, raising her kids, and dealing with a husband who, you know how unbelievers can be. It was very challenging, but she didn't give up. She didn't lose heart. She honored God's word, and ultimately, a man was saved. I wonder, can we endure some discomfort so that someone can come to salvation? Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Pray with one another. Pray for your unbelieving husband. Don't lose heart. God's word had a specific word for you here today. That's a powerful thing. Because throughout human history, men didn't talk to women. They didn't treat them well. But God loves you, and he treats you very well. And he has plans for you. Be in submission to him as we're all to be in submission to him. Would you stand up? Father, thank you we can be reminded that submission does not equal inferiority, that it doesn't equal the things that the philosophers of our age have come up with. It doesn't equal even the criticisms that people lobby at the church or lobby at the word of God because they don't understand what submission really means and they don't understand what God is doing in the world. Lord, help us. Help us in our marriages because it's our marriages that seem to have crumbled over the last few decades, Lord. Help us as the institution of marriage has even been redefined in the culture we live in today. Lord, help us not to use that as an excuse to let go of our God-given calling in our families. Help us, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.